Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, episode of Deconstructed. I have uh, the privilege of being with a very, very wonderful guest today. However, on the same note, Mudisir will not actually be joining me today as he's uh, occupied with other things. Ever so briefly, for those that are listening live or looking at the recording, this is a bit of a continuation of the Agility, Resilience, and Anti-Fragility 2020 event. So we have, again, the great privilege to be with Thomas, who I'll introduce here in a minute. Ever so briefly, uh, my name is Sai, and I am a transformation and change uh, consultant and coach. I partner with organizations to help them really calibrate their business models and operating models and, and integrate all the facets of business and strategy and leadership and culture and execution and technology to, to maximize their impact. Uh, particularly, I focus on helping them really deal with the reality of the situation, their own human nature and identity to ensure that aliveness that they have within them through awareness to achieve that impact. So before inviting Thomas on, I'll, I'll mention a few things. He's got a, a, a tremendous book that uh, I highly encourage folks to take a look at. He brings a, an international perspective as, a, as an international crisis leader with, with multiple decades and really bringing his experiences from over 23 countries where, where he's helped uh, in those contexts to deal with conflict and disaster contexts to really deal with some of the most complex emergencies of our time. So definitively a very unique perspective that we want to tap into. I also tremendously appreciate his passion for simulation and game-based solutions that effectively help uh, leaders really learn in an interactive way. So I have not done the man justice by any stretch, but with that being said, Thomas, welcome to the conversation, my friend. Thank you, Saya. You've done me more than justice. Thanks. It's good to be here. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have you. I would love for you to kind of introduce yourself to, to, uh, to our audience in your own words, Thomas. Who, who is Thomas? Uh, who's Thomas? Thomas is, in a way, just a guy. Uh, I happened to end up in, in this crisis work, a bit of what you just described, um, many, many years ago. And has it's just been the red thread through my career, working with crisis, conflicts, disasters, as you also manage, uh, mentioned. And for the past few years, I have, um, I've worked for myself. I took a bit of a break from, from going out there and being right in the, in the field and actually transitioned a bit into more competence and skill development. This is what I do now. I support leaders, organizations in building skills and competencies, particularly when it comes to crisis, but also when it comes to really topics as resilience, uh, generally learning, et cetera. Wonderful. And I, and I have to tell you, I really, en I really enjoyed uh, navigating beyond crisis. The way that you organized the perspective, I thought was very powerful. And, and if you don't mind me just briefly mentioning the fundamentals about people and communication, the craft of reinvention and resources and, and, and habitual, and I love that, habitual readiness was very powerful. And then application around crisis systems, expanding options and, and confidence. And, and definitely your, your final thoughts encapsulated so much for, for me, if you will. So, so you know, any, any sort of kind of setting the stage, how do you suggest we look at the world from a crisis management vernacular? Well, honestly, if I could, I would actually eliminate the term crisis. Um, I think it's uh, unfortunately gotten a bit derailed because originally it meant turning point, decision point, uh, rather neutral. Now it's a pretty negative connotation. People are looking at it for a negative lens and that has over the past years kind of built up. Um, so now it's used for different things. So either it's, it's, it's a term that used, is used for escalation of things, for really creating a sense of urgency. But unfortunately, it also does something in us when we hear it. So I think that's that's a bit the tricky thing. It's it's important that we we look upon crisis maybe not as something negative, but maybe as an inevitable point of change, and that also gives us the power back. If we just simply move out, yeah, we have to change something because things the way we've done them so far they didn't work, or we weren't we weren't ready for particular situations means we have to change something. And by already eliminating the term, you kind of take a bit out the urgency because often I, when I hear crisis or when people say crisis, they, they get immediately elevated. They have like a high pulse. They think something needs to be done this particular moment. And unless it's a life or death situation, it doesn't have to have particular, happen this particular moment. So there's always time. And taking away that term, I've noticed does something to people. It gives them a bit of calm back and it allows them to take the ownership back. And I think that that angle might work. Excellent, excellent. And, and I know as you, as the summary in the book, you talk about demystifying the term. And I think you, you've set the stage perfectly. It's a natural, unavoidable, necessary step as, as, you, as you describe it as a decision point. And then we can act on that decision. So 
the empowerment aspect is very key, especially as we've experienced over the past uh, number of years, uh, Thomas. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Absolutely. I think I think what is what is the most difficult thing for people or what I hear maybe to start there very often is I'm losing control. And that's really the feeling we're not we're not in control of anything that happens anymore. But that's also because we put the focus on things that we can't influence. So we're really obsessed with how the context evolves around us and, and follow up. And if this is so fast paced as it's these days, we, we struggle to follow. Of course, we feel like we're losing control. So that is the first step. And instead focusing on what is that we can do and really this reframing of the problem. So what is my particular problem in this situation? Because sometimes what is labeled crisis is not my problem, it's just an, an umbrella term, right? So this is why it all of a sudden we adopt things like refugee crisis or climate crisis. And I'm not arguing it's not a crisis, but I think it means something different for everyone. I live in Norway. The climate crisis here is very different from the Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia. So while it's all the same term, I think it doesn't really give us access point if we only label it like that. But the but dissecting it more, going into the depth and not using the simple term crisis, but really going deeper allows us actually to have access points. And that usually comes with leverage and that comes with opportunities and options. Very, very well said. It. And exactly as to your point, it's just a whole different experience through the reframing and the access points or the, as I like to say, the anchors or focal points create a whole different set of uh, under uh, understanding of the situation, the decisions, the actions we can take. Um, Thomas, if you don't mind me asking, sort of one of the key things that you emphasize is really underestimating ourselves. And you suggest that we should not underestimate ourselves, uh, you know, as, as people were, and as you say, we're, we're born with natural abilities to adapt and reinvent. Um, and the question, as I read your work, quite honestly, came to my mind is what happened in our journey that made us forget that we can be so adaptable and evolvable? There's, there's many things that happen. I have over the past year, I have extensively observed my own children. They're eight and three, because I personally think there's no more natural learners on this planet and arguably better crisis managers than our children, because yeah. they, they, they're born in a world of unknown. So they know nothing technically. And, and they have to deal with this and with new rules and new boundaries and, and things that don't work every single day. So all of these are characteristic of a crisis. So what happened along the way is, is, is interesting because when I, when I look at them, they have a way more natural approach to testing out things. So they, they dare more, they'd be more daring in, in the sense of what is it that we can do to solve this, to solve this situation. I try this, it doesn't work, I try something else. We on the other hand, because, and this is of course something that goes a little bit against uh, the, the, what's, what's usually standard in the field, I argue that sometimes our experience comes in our own way because our experience and the older we get gives us the opportunity to, to have abstract thinking. So we actually can think about that there is something like the unknown for our children. That's the, that's the permanent status, right? For us, this is an abstract concept that we try to fill with assumptions and assumptions are for me. And you've seen this in my book. It's a recurring factor that, that we have to talk about. It's not that we can eliminate them. They're important for us to interact with the world, but we can, we can take a look at them and we can reflect over them. And the thing is that we, once we are aware that those are assumptions and it's not the reality as it will be, it's just one potential reality, we still have the chance to change, adapt and do things. And I think that, that ownership is important because that gives us the empowerment to go back to those skills we have which are adaptability. We're naturally adapting. I mean, we all did it for COVID. All of a sudden, home office wasn't an issue anymore. The transition into technical solutions that were so difficult before went so smoothly all of a sudden. So we're prone to adapt. We're prone to reinvent as well in the sense of that we, when we're open to it, find different solutions for tools that we have, resources that we have. And I think getting that a bit back and practicing something that we really can practice makes a difference. And along the way, We've lost it. We were taught. We have probably been told that this is not what we should be doing, but I think we should. Very beautifully expressed. And, and, I, and I really, really appreciate you say that the unknown is natural for children. And, and as, as, as I've worked with, if you will, organizations, I tell them, if you look at reality, it isn't good or bad. It just is, if you will. And you have to work with it. There's no way around it. Um, I, I want to ask you a very particular question because I think it's very powerful as you're emphasizing, uh, Thomas. Do you feel like we as adults in particular, especially as there is more complexity in the environment, do we overthink? And what guidance might you have for us so that we don't let our brains escape us in, we, in that overthinking? 
I, I think we overthink a lot, way too much. Uh, because there's, there's, there's a couple of examples I can give. One is that we always look for the best solution. Like technically when I have a problem, I need a solution. It's, it's, it's in a way regardless if it's the best or not the best. I need a solution for this problem. But we're always looking for the best. So we keep thinking and pondering and wondering if this is actually the right solution or the wrong solution. So we have concepts like right and wrong, good or bad. These are things that I don't really work with because I think they're limiting our thinking and they actually put a lot of pressure on us because there's always a fail and there's a succeed. And if you eliminate that and just simply say, I need a solution for this problem, might make it a lot easier. So we technically, over, we, we definitely overthink. Another example would be, we're always looking for information. So there's this, there's the belief that the more information I have in a crisis, the better I will manage it. Can also be the other way around. There's typical things with decisions when you have too much information, all of a sudden you have to consider all these factors that you didn't want to consider before. And some, some of them are just white noise. But in a stressful situation, we're not able to distinguish that anymore, what's white noise and what isn't. So I think, I, I think we definitely overthink. And going back to the basics, just really like, what is it that I have to do now? What is it that I can do? How does it feel? Emotions are a very, very important part of my work. Uh, I don't believe in this, like, do everything rational. I think get in touch with your emotions. They also give you access to your needs. They give you access to potential solutions for the problem. So they're very important. Go back to that, reflect, and just look where the confidence is. And you mentioned it before, one chapter in my book is on confident decision making, because I think that's, that's what we have to learn, finding our confidence. Be beautifully expressed as those. And, and, and I really, really, like I said, I really enjoyed the book tremendously. And, and one of the aspects I'd love for you to elaborate on is you've just called it out, the, the balance and integration of emo being emotional as well as rational creatures. Um, you know, please expand your thoughts as to what kind of wisdom we can gain from, from your experience. Emotions scare us somehow as an adult, right? So we have, uh, similar again with the children, right? They're, they, they can't control or manage their emotions yet. And in a way, that's an advantage because you always know where they are. As adults, we, we try to suppress them. Now, when I work in a crisis team, we're all affected by the situation. I was in situations where I, I, would, have, I, I would have lied if I said, like, this doesn't affect me. Um, people suffering around me, everything collapsed. Uh, sometimes it was war zones, you know, so those things affect you emotionally. And I cannot, I, I can confidently say, I don't think I have in any of the crisis ever made a rational decision. Because I think that is a claim that would, would not stand if you would actually look honestly in the mirror. But what I've done is I have learned to accept and acknowledge that emotions are part of this. So that doesn't mean I have let the emotions guide my judgment or my, my decision. But I've acknowledged them and I've explored them. Because if I was afraid, if I was worried, if I was insecure, those are all things they come from somewhere. So I was just exploring that. So where does my insecurity come from uh, about this decision? And what I find there is that I don't have enough information. Information. I'm, I'm not sure about the potential outcome. I'm actually worried about my own position, what it would do if I make a wrong decision. And those things are so powerful if you know them. Because you can either do something with it, or you can just acknowledge that they're there. And acknowledging really lifts weight of your shoulders. So what I encourage every leader to do is regularly make space for these emotions. Make that a habit. And don't, there's always time. Again, I can re not emphasize that enough. But it will cost you if you don't do that because they will come back. Emotions have that habit. They, they, they're, they're part of boiling water. They come back and then the time is even more inconvenient. So get ahead of it. Make time and space for it. It doesn't usually take more than maybe 10, 15 minutes because it's, it's about acknowledging. Yeah, we are afraid. Yes, we're afraid. And that's okay. We all, we all know that now. Let's just move on. And, that's, and that works. It sounds super simple, and it sounds almost a bit, a bit unrealistic, but I guarantee you it works. I've done it many times. Very well said. And likewise, I've experienced it with leaders myself. And, and you know, one of the, I think one of the key things as you're calling out, we don't venture into exploring our emotions because of our, our, our concern. If you, as you said, we're scared, perhaps to even lose more control. When the reality is if we embrace it and integrate it, with the rational, so that the emotions or the rational are not simply alone guiding us. It's a whole different experience of the world around us. Particularly one aspect is important, and uh, that's intuition. And we all have it. We're all, we all, this is, of course, partly experience-based, but it's partly also nat natural instincts we have. And I, I would never ignore uh, my, in my intuition. And it's not that I always decide what my intuition tells me. 
but it's important to explore why this, for example, where this feeling or this gut feeling, as we call it, comes from. Because technically, that's also a decision-making process. It's very well researched, meanwhile, that this is already an internal decision-making process against, against the rudimentary basic criteria that we have for decision-making. And if that gut feeling, if you learn how to work with it, then your intuition on the one hand grows, and on the other hand, is really, um, is really a very, very helpful tool and a helpful skill to use. And of course, I always hear, yeah, the biases. Yes, the biases are there. But I have a, a little trick, and every time I try this with with um, with leaders in company companies that you know top leaders that have all the responsibility, they're always surprised about how this works. And I, I exclude them from the development of the options for a problem. So I, I say, like you, you're the decision maker. You will make this decision. You're not sitting in the discussions on, on potential solutions because what will happen is you create your own bias in that discussion. You, you might you might actually come up with your own solution or you might hear something that you like and then you're you're blind blind to everything else that happens if the team at the end of it discusses through resources options everything comes to you and say like these are the three choices that we think are most feasible you have an, a natural intuitive reaction and that falls away if you're part of the development process of the solutions and leaders were like oh yeah that actually worked, that really worked for them and it relieved them a little bit of the pressure because they could completely focus on the decision making itself and not on the solutions. And that was um, yeah, a little trick that, that is worth trying. It's, it's very powerful, extremely powerful, as you described it, our exploration of options, if you will, in the creation of, of options and the experience that we have actually manifests the biases before the decision making, exactly yeah. as, as you're saying. There's, there's, I, I would love for you to comment on a few things, if you don't mind, Thomas, because I think they're, sure. they're, they're, they penetrate through the book, in, in particular, in the wisdom that you offer, the role of intuition, as you've just called out, and then our ability to improvise, if you will, and how that fits into the equation. Our ability to improvise is, is I think, is based on the fact that we can, we can identify our assumptions. And by those assumptions, I mean what's often referred to as mental models, so the most fundamental assumptions we have, basically the, what my children are building right now in the sense of this is how the world works. And one example I always bring for what a mental model would be, for example, is that I myself wasn't aware of those concepts many, many years ago. And uh, when I came to South Africa for the first time, I had dinner with friends, and then there would be this uh, one friend sitting down at the table and he was wearing a cap. And I had like all of a sudden a complete inner reaction, like this, isn't, this, this doesn't work. You, you can't sit down and, at a dinner table and have a cat cap because my my father's voice that was in the back of my head like we don't wear hats at the dinner table and it's like this is a mental model right so in my world this was how it needs to be and how it needs to be everywhere and every time we say something like oh this is common sense right or uh, everybody should know that these are the mental models that we we have and we have lots of those and the problem with these mental models is they stop us from improvising because they give us the perspective of how things should be, how resources should be used, um, how certain processes should be run. We should, for example, plan for the next crisis. This is also a mental model that I'm really trying to actively work against because planning, yes, it's one, one part in the whole process, but it's not giving you the answer to everything. And this is identifying these mental models is, for example, opening up to the, the terms of improvisation. And the second thing that I recommend is people always ask yourself so have constantly this thing what else can I do with this whether it's your mobile phone whether it's just a piece of paper whether it's a pen there's so many things you can do with with this beyond its usual functionality and just simply practicing that will help you in a crisis coming up with come up with with completely different solutions these out-of-the-box solutions that we always want um, if we're not prisoners to our own, own mental models that works and intuitions sometimes they give us they give us indicators they give us indicators whether something doesn't work or whether we are overlooking something or yeah there's one more thing maybe one sentence to that it's um uh, gary klein I'm, I'm a big fan of gary klein who, who wrote several book on intu books on intuition and decision making and he calls calls uh, one concept creative desperation so he brings a couple of examples that when we have no other options we throw out everything we know throw everything overboard some some listeners might have seen that movie with um, I don't know the person's name anymore, but the person being trapped in the Grand Canyon mm. and cannot and cannot leave. And uh, so he brings this as an example of creative desperation because it didn't occur to the person at any point until the bitter end to cut off his arm. 
because we have to have both arms, right? This is not an option. We need to have those arms. And only in the last bit when he says like it's gonna, it's about we are about to die, then he's like, well, I might have to cut it off. So this was this is a typical example for breaking a mental model and finding new uh, solutions and improvising. It doesn't always have to be as drastic as this example, but this illustrates it very well. Very well expressed. I, I, again, I, and, and these are the ways that we have to shift our thinking, shift our, our, our views, if you will, exactly as, as you're saying, especially as we proceed in even potentially more turbulent times that we have to confront uh, as, as a as society across the board. Another, and, and I'm reminded of uh, Gary Hamill's quote, we, I think he says, we're all prisoners of our experiences and our paradigms. And, mm -hmm. and, and to, to, Love that. to, yeah, so I'm very, very powerful uh, in that expression. The, the other thing I would love for you to comment on is the the role of ego as it enters the the, the crisis situation, if you will, and the mental models and the, and the worldview that we have uh, and control, if you will. Ego is, is, I think, one of the biggest obstacles to effective crisis management. So um, there's either there's the false pride of I have the whole responsibility. Um, it's I was prisoner myself to that, speaking of, of uh, with that fam a beautiful quote that you pointed out. I was a prisoner to that in the beginning of my career. I had the feeling I, I need to know everything. I cannot show any weakness. Certainly I can't show any emotions um, because everything will collapse around me. I carry the whole responsibility. So basically I just kept pulling in responsibility. And this is when you often hear from leaders, it gets lonely on the top. Well, most often it gets lonely at the top because it's self-made. It's because we're leaving out the people, the, the, because everybody around us is a resource. I keep saying in a crisis, everything is a resource. And certainly the people around us, because they come with backpacks of resources, knowledge, experience, contacts, whatever whatever you want. And part, part of the reason why we keep them out is ego. It's, it's the fear of not looking good uh, when we are not managing the crisis. It's the, the, the sense of responsibility. Why do CEOs have to sit in crisis management teams? They don't. They have plenty of other stuff to do to keep the, the company afloat. But they sit in crisis management teams during the during the pandemic. Friends of mine, they run a company, at, uh, IT communications company. So basically, the ones that should have benefited the most uh, in this pandemic, they almost they almost went bankrupt because their whole senior leadership team was only sitting in crisis management teams in the beginning of the pandemic, and only then they understood like, well, our teams don't have any leaders. We actually put where the ego of having to do this and. There's adrenaline involved. I'm not going to lie. Crisis management comes with adrenaline, and it's you know it's a it's a nice change in some way to the to the mundane everyday work. So of course people like it, yeah. but it's ego. Uh, it comes in the way, and ultimately this can really have a negative effect on on crisis management as such. Beautifully expressed. So I, I have to tell you, one of the things that I do with executives is that adrenaline rush is I actually take them out on a motorcycle. And I, I say, ride the motorcycle with me. And they experience essentially that adrenaline hit. I said, well, if you want an adrenaline hit, ride a motorcycle. Don't go yeah. ahead and, and, and look for, for a crisis, if you will. Wonderful example. I will, I'll take that in. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. My, my good friend, as, as we're having the conversation, one of the things that, and, and again, from your work, you know, how do we challenge ourselves to, to truly challenge ourselves and challenge our assumptions and challenge our, our, our I'll say, uh, uh, affinity for adrenaline. Just how do we challenge ourselves to kind of really embrace the things that you're saying, truly? I think we have to cut ourselves some slack because this is not going to change from one moment to the other. And you mentioned before the model that I introduced in the book is for me, it's, it's called habitual readiness. So basically it's all about habits and habits are, of course, not, not only since, uh, what's it called, uh, Atomic Habits and, and other books, yeah. a lot uh, often discussed topic. But I also learned that in crisis management, this, this is one of the best ways to prepare yourself because you're not you're not really looking into a potential future situation that hypothetically might play out one way or the other, which is where the planning comes in. But you're actually looking at what can I do to be ready when this comes, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. And that's in my world through habits and habits are the small changes. I also want to make it clear here, people often in my perspective, they use the word routines and habits interchangeably. But for me, there's a difference. Routines is for me doing the same things the same way. But habits is doing the same things in a different way. Take, for example, brushing your teeth. Right? We brush our teeth twice a day, most of us, and 
this is if we do it the same way men are prone to do things the same way so they sometimes bend over the the sink and brush our teeth and we're not moving and can't do anything else and use the right hand this would be a routine if you just do a, a minor change like put take your left hand stand on one leg stand on the other leg like you're already changing the routine to a habit and that's when it becomes interesting and from from, from my perspective habits like constantly question your assumptions that could be in a playful way that could be in a in a coordinated way however you do this but this is this helps you that when the time comes when you need this it's an automatism you will do it without even noticing it the same is if exchanging perspectives it sounds so simple we all think we're constantly exchanging perspectives but when you go into the next meeting and come out of it ask did you hear everybody's perspective on a, a difficult question and i almost guarantee you you didn't and those are things that we can practice and with that we also move slowly towards embracing some of those things that at least i suggest and not everybody has to embrace everything but but make it your own and find the habits that work for you and if you do that i think you will move towards readiness and you will move towards a mindset that helps you be more adaptable more open and more proactive in a crisis excellent and and, and definitively the the underlying tone of both curiosity and creativity is very very powerful and and exactly, Thomas, as you mentioned, I, I, challenging our assumptions. I always, when I work with leaders, I say, look, at, challenge your assumptions, challenge your constraints even, and challenge your dependencies to understand the, the, the potential breadth and the, 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 the depth of the unknown that we may be stepping into. And it, it opens up all sorts of perspectives, to your point. It's very similar to what, what I read. I mean, what you just said is, is similar to the points I lay out in my book, which is yeah. the constraints and, and the assumptions, specifically when it comes to resources. Yeah. Most, most organizations have not the slightest clue which resources they have available. But we're constantly on the lookout for more resources. When you, as leaders, if you listen, uh, think about, do you know how many languages are spoken in your team? Mm. Simply that question. It's a simple question. How many languages do the team members of your team speak? So all of that could be resources potentially, right? And this goes, there's more and more questions you could ask, but, but it's, it's just really this looking at what resources do we have at hand? Because what it does, if we look constantly for other resources, we make ourselves vulnerable. And I've seen many crisis management plans and crisis responses that were based on an assumption we have access to a particular resource because we needed it, but we didn't because they weren't, this wasn't our resource to begin with. And then the house of cards crumbled eventually. So it's very, very important. And I, I just can underline what you just said. It's really question your assumptions constantly. And one of the most powerful habits that I use and really that I drill into people when I work with them is what I call the magic moment. You might remember that from my book, but it's really that, that moment before you dive in, just make a stop, take a breath, breath. Like, do we all see this the same way? and then go ahead and do this regularly throughout the process. Because if you don't do this, the situation might be a completely different one and you work in a direction that's not relevant anymore. But having these regular stops and say like, is the situation still the same? Are we in agreement? Is there different perspectives? Share this and then go back in. And that time's always there. Yeah, Be beautifully expressed. And one of the key things is, I mean, as we are talking about this, and this is, again, resonated very deeply with me as, as, as I approached your book, if we are looking for an adrenaline hit, if you will, in a crisis, taking on these, these habits, if you will, and approaching the world slightly differently really brings that back into the, the more respectfully ordinary time so that we don't have to always go after a crisis. And, and as, I, as, I, as you emphasize the distinction between routines and habits, I tell folks, you know, these are muscles to exercise. If you, if you have a muscle, right, and you keep doing the same routine, you're not going to flex that muscle. You have to get into the habit of, of different ways of, of expanding that muscle. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I can, I can just, I fully agree with that because I think it's, it's really that what, what, when, you, when you slightly modify your habits, they also keep people engaged because routines have unfortunately the, the, the side effect that they become boring and they, they, they actually drain our attention and we lose it and we, you know, are not as engaged. If you have a habit, if you stimulate a little bit the creativity, whether it's in a meeting or whether it's in you know any other activity that you do within your company or organization, then you can really keep people engaged because they don't know what's coming. Like when I run workshops, I work I work very often with cliffhangers. I work with throwing them into the cold waters. I don't even give them the chance to settle in and oh, what's going to come now, but more like 
you're working from 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 second one in this workshop because this is what it's called and this is what it's going to be it's about an experience and having people on their toes gives also that little adrenaline kick because you like to go to work you don't know what's coming you're engaged there's always something happening and you can do that so you can have uh really that slight adrenaline elevation already there and when a crisis comes it's not such a peak as it usually is because that's often what what throws companies off is the disruption yeah so i also encourage you work with disruption work with all of a sudden you have half the resources available that you have available and you still have to solve the problem and you'll be surprised what comes out of it yeah yeah it's very very powerful my, my good friend i want to i want to go into another area which i think it, you can you can offer a lot of wisdom uh, <laughs> and and i and i absolutely love it because it's i want you to describe as how you apply the technique you talk about you know uh developing simulated and game-based solutions for interactive mm -hmm. learning i'd love for you to, to explore that a little bit with us it, what i call i call those learning arenas so for me for me learning is a holistic experience so what we often do as adults also is that we learn cognitively so we get information and we think that's learning for me for me learning is experience so that includes the cognitive information but that's just part of it i use the four steps basically of an experience you uh find your you make sense of what you basically have found out then you apply the insights so basically this is the circle that you constantly have to work through game-based learning for me is a way of us becoming children again because of whether we want it or not in games at one point or the other even if there might be initial resilience eventually everybody gives in we become those children that we were and the beauty with beautiful thing with games is they create a safe space but we still behaving and have still to deal with human connections challenges interactions you name it as it would be in the real world only the topic is different so what this what this does is it teaches us skills it gives us basically the, the opportunity to also experience emotions because we might feel face rejections we might face um, you know the adrenaline kick are we better than the others or not it's a lot you can do with with game-based solutions so my my aim is to to create game-based solutions because they offer an arena where people can be not themselves and still practice their skills. So it kind of relieves them a little bit of the pressure that they have in their everyday life. Like many workshops, we always work on the constant problems in the everyday life. I take them out of this. We, we find ways on how to address problems and then take maybe the process back into the everyday life. And that is a very different approach. And I have only made good experiences with it. And it's also really enjoyable because I, who doesn't love to play? Those who to say they don't, they don't like to play, they might have had bad experiences in the past, but that shouldn't stop them from trying it again. Very well said. And, and, and I, I really appreciate exactly as you're saying, and, I, and quite honestly, you, I'll say you took the thunder out of what I was going to go toward because you said it perfectly. <laughs> no, 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 all good, all good. <laughs> it's, it's about becoming children again. And that sense of aliveness, returning to that sense of aliveness, which then fuels us in, as adults in the way that we approach things, if you will. It's very, very powerful. I've sometimes I've sometimes experienced in these in these workshops that people come to me at the end of the day and say like well we played now a lot but tomorrow we have to do some real work yeah and I'm like well what do you think is what do you think we did today and I was like yeah we just played I'm like okay let's let's just look a bit deeper into what we did today so we went into how we communicated we went into how we solved the problems and then they all like often are left with dropping charts and like I didn't I didn't feel like we were working so much today I'm like yes that's exactly because of the arena. That's, that's the beauty with games. You're not feeling how much you're actually doing, learning and progressing when you're playing because you're preoccupied with, with something else, but still you're working and it just makes it more fun to approach it. And I'm not saying game is the solution for everything. I think there's also here, you mentioned the word balance before. I'm a huge fan of balance. All, everything needs to be in balance somehow. And, and games have their effect at one or the other point. I even think I have, I have also worked with games a lot in crisis management. Um, and where people think this is crazy, I'm like, no, this is not. Because if they make people laugh, for example, if it's a five minute game that makes people laugh, the pressure is gone, the, the, the brain is more open, uh, the, the view is not as narrow as it needed to be. And it's just really, you know, you see things differently. All of a sudden you might pop up, um, a new idea might pop up and it works. Um, it's just about daring. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and likewise, if I, I also, uh, emphasize one of the things that you mentioned. It's uh, you said, be not themselves. There is a shift in identity 
through the experience and through the uh, engaging the arena and engaging one each other, uh, each other. So it's extremely powerful. We're not the same people after we enter the arena and when we leave. Absolutely not. The the some and, and this is also a, a huge huge advantage for how to get to, to get to know the team. So when I have a new team, sometimes we had these crisis teams that had you know within a couple of hours had to function on the ground. So we had basically a few hours to become a team. And what you don't want is to only that the team only forms over problems, challenges, and and really the suffering they see in these contexts. So we had a couple of hours on the plane or when we were waiting. We always engaged in a game. Always, because, and this it wasn't a big game, but it was just really one way of, on the one hand, distracting ourselves a little bit, and on the other hand, it was also to get to know the different sides of the characters. Because also in games, in, in playful uh, arenas, the different um, competencies come out. So some might be bad at that, others might be better at that, and it's usually also common experience. And I'm a big fan for for creating these common experiences, whether they're challenging or not. I, also in workshops, I take. I remind the people that you're not going out the comfort zone individually. You're leaving it collectively, which brings you together. Um, it's, a, it's a shared experience that is outside your comfort zone, which brings you naturally closer. And yeah. you, you, you've seen this many times. There's lots of examples when, when, when teams, groups, people, bigger groups w uh, went through difficult or, or you know, challenging experiences. They're very tight afterwards because yeah. it bounds them together. And the same works with games. The, the power is it's extensive. Not only do we learn about each other, we learn about ourselves. And we're, we actually are surprised by, well, I didn't realize I could do that. I didn't realize that I could make that happen. I didn't realize that we could do even, we can be so much more than, than I anticipated. Very, very powerful. So I, I'm also reminded of another quote, actually, from Mark Twain, where he emphasized, uh, and if I remember it correctly, he says, you know, what work I've done, I've done because it has been play and it makes all the difference to be able to entertain and play together and play and contribute to that whole experience as, as, as you're describing. That, that's, that's the other thing. I love that because it's, it's a connector and it don't, doesn't only bring, bring people together, but it also connects you to other people by, by default. That can be individuals and that can be a bigger group because what we need, and particularly linking a bit back to crisis as well, is that we, we need this interconnectedness. And one of my final thoughts also that you, that you outlined, uh, outlined on this, the, the nice slide that you produced for this life, um, is that I think we're, we're forgetting how important interconnectedness is. I've, I've had the privilege to spend a lot of time and, and worked with indigenous peoples around the world. And, and, they, and, and also in other contexts, in, in conflict contests that go on for 30 years, 40 years, people ask, how can people survive? Well. Yeah. They, they don't put the individual before the collective. They are equally important, but they say like, I can survive this only in a group, only by being interconnected to others. And this is what we often forget. Like we've, we're increasingly, increasingly isolating ourselves. We increasingly think we have to do everything alone and all pressures on us, but there's a lot of solutions out there, a lot of different approaches and m more brains think better than one. And even if one finds the solutions in the end, well, might have been stimulated by others. So go back, reconnect, and one way of doing this is play. Very beautifully said. And, and I, I like to emphasize it sometimes. I always tell people it's always a win-win or a lose-lose. There is no win-lose because as soon as it becomes a win-lose, it's a lose-lose at that point. Yeah, it's a lose line. Yeah, I like that. And, yeah. yeah, and there's no way around it. And to, to, to quote, if you will, respectfully, one of my mentors, uh, Judith Glacier, she, she's very much about the we-centric viewpoint. The I is not lost in the we. It's a key contributor in the DNA of the we. So it, there's tremendous value in all of that. That is, that is very along the lines of, of these indigenous uh, philosophies that I got to know a little bit, which is you have, you, of course, you're the I, but you're nothing without the we. But you also, yeah. the we is nothing without the I because you have to contribute. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a we. So it's it's just uh, this constant balance and back and forth and both valuing both sides. So it's not either we or either I. They're interconnected as well, and I think that's that's important to remember. And and and, I, and, I, and critically, the, the the paradoxical shift from the or to the and is a tremendous uh, uh, way to look at the world. Mm -hmm. So 
So my good friend, I know we're running a short on time, but it, it, it proved me. You, you, you used the key word, which is very powerful. You've used it actually twice in our conversation, if, if I'm recollecting correctly, but it's a very powerful word I'd love for you to expand on. And that is the notion of daring and approaching the world with that, with that sense. I'd love for you to, to elaborate further. We've become very careful. Um, I think we've become very passive. And part of that is what I've said before that we basically we assume everything that's going to happen. So we basically play out the world in our heads. Uh, Austrian communication psychologist from 70s, 80s, Paul Watzlawick, he, he had this famous story about it, um, a man and a hammer. So a man who needed to pick a, a, hang up a painting on the wall and he didn't have a hammer, he only had a nail. So he was thinking about, well, I could go to the neighbor and ask him for a hammer. And then to cut the longer story short now, then he goes with his thoughts to, oh, I met the neighbor the other day in the, uh, in the staircase and he didn't greet me. And generally was in the last days very unfriendly. Uh, so I don't think he likes me and I don't think he would borrow me the hammer. And he, he keeps playing this out in his head. It's all in his head. And the story ends with him walking over, knocking at the door. When the neighbor opens, he's like, you can keep your bloody hammer. So, and this is what we sometimes do, right? This is what stops us also from being daring because we play out how the world's going to evolve around us. The beautiful thing with the unknown is that it's nothing but the future. So if, why not just uh, take it in our own hands, become explorers, see what, what's, what's waiting there. And I don't think there's any better way to be, to manage a crisis or anyway, life, if you want, than being proactive and not letting it come to us, but taking it. And I think that is something we have to relearn. That is something we have to, again, remember, look at the kids. This is what they do. Every t they, until they, they reach boundaries, until they, you know, are stopped by something, but it doesn't take their energy away. Yeah. They dare, they try and they yeah. do. And this is something we have to, have to be big, become better because I think it's a decisive advantage when it comes to crisis and future events. Beautifully expressed. I, to, and, and quite honestly, I've gone so far as to help executives go and with, per, with permissions in place to go observe a daycare because they see children in action and there's so many lessons to be taken from that that we can extract, if you will. I hope you continue that because I can, I can just agree. I think there's... Observing my kids, there's so much to learn. And the beautiful thing, that's what I always keep saying, we all were kids. So we all knew how to do that once. Yes. So it's not, it's not something that we have to completely learn, learn from scratch. Just have to remember how it's done. Because we all liked it. We all had different experiences of our childhood, but we had those characteristics, skills, and competences back then. And it's about reviving and rekindling that. And that's possible. Very beautifully said. My good friend, my I, I, tr tremendous time. I love actually one of the other things that you just mentioned a few minutes ago. The unknown is nothing but the future. It's such a powerful statement that you've made. And if we re we, we remind ourselves, it can, it can change our, our whole experience of the world around us and, and what have you. I, in saying that, closing thoughts, Thomas, that you want to leave our audience with that perhaps that we haven't touched on. So closing thoughts are, are very much welcome. Closing thoughts, I think for me, is always the same. It's like trust in your own abilities because you all, whoever is listening, you all have the abilities it takes to manage a crisis, to maybe not even have to call it a crisis, but manage change and be proactive and design your own path forward because that's what it is. Every path, every, every path, every hike, every tour, every travel, they have turns and a crisis is nothing but a turn. And you can decide which way to go. Find out as a last sentence, find out where your confidence lies. Don't judge yourself with right or wrong. Judge yourself with, am I confident or not? And if you're not, explore and you'll find the answers. Beautiful, beautiful expressed. An honor to have you, my, my good friend, a tremendous honor to have you. And I hope in the future we return to, to share more of your experiences uh, as the journey continues. So thank you for making the time, Thomas. Thank you, Sai, for having me. And it was a great conversation. I really, really appreciated your questions, your insight, and thank you for being here. Sentiments, likewise, sentiments mutual, sentiments mutual all around, Thomas. And 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 again, folks, as, as that those that have joined us today, and likewise those that are listening to the recording, highly recommend taking a look at Thomas's work. And uh, the the light bulbs will go off uh, immediately. I'll put it that way. So thank you for for everyone, and we look forward to future conversations. Thank you again, Thomas, and all. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care now. Bye bye.